Welcome to a very special video episode of Vancouver Opera Offstage, Coaches in Conversation. I'm your host, Les Dalla, Chorus Director and Associate Conductor of Vancouver Opera. As always, you can find this episode with our weekly audio podcasts as we connect with opera experts, artists, staff, and others to explore the world of opera on and off the stage. For those of you watching the video, don't forget to hit the like button below and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite streaming services. Before we begin, I'd like to say that we are honored to share our stories on the unceded homelands of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Today's episode is a bit of a different format than our usual podcast in that we are doing this episode with two guests on video. I'm joined on video by the wonderful musical staff at Vancouver Opera. Kinza Tyrrell, Principal Repetiteur and Associate Chorus Director, and Tina Chang, Pianist and Repetiteur at Vancouver Opera. We'll talk about the role of the Repetiteur in opera and demystify this rather exotic sounding title. Welcome, Kinza and Tina. Hello, everybody. Thanks for so having nice. us. It's great uh, to see you. It's been a while since we've seen each other in person. Um, and a lot has happened in the last couple of months uh, in order to keep what we do alive we've got this podcast going and i'm so delighted that you're both joining uh, me today uh, we've worked together for a long time the three of us and um, i think a lot of people don't know what it is that you do and that we all do and so today we will demystify this this term repetitor so i'm, I'm going to ask you both and kinza let's start with you how would you define the term repetiteur? And how often have you had to explain what you do to people? Okay, I'm gonna keep this answer quite simple because I know as we go with the questions, we'll explain further what it can all entail. Um, the, the basic skeleton of what we do as repetiteurs is we play the staging rehearsals instead of the orchestra. Um, so repetiteur in French and German uh, literally means repeater. So we repeat and repeat and repeat, which is what rehearsing is. So that's the, the base of what we do. Tina, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, as far as job description go, I kind of call it the every man of the room. You kind of have to be a little bit of everything as well. So, but you also have to be as invisible as, as, <laughs> as possible. So, and like Kinza said, as we dive into more of the questions that come up, um, more will be explained through what we do. Totally, okay. So uh, Tina, I'll stay with you on this one to start. How did you get into this profession? Actually by accident, I was graduating from graduate school, I don't want to say how many years ago, and I was in the States doing my grad school, and at the time I wasn't sure what my career prospects are going to be so I sent out resumes to every musical organization that I know and could get my hands on and San Diego Opera was one of the ensembles that I sent my resume into and actually I didn't uh, get accepted when I sent my resume in because they already had somebody so I went to um, Halifax to be a studio pianist for Marcia Swanson's voice studio at Dalhousie University for a, two years, after which I decided to move back to Vancouver uh, to be t with my family. Uh, at that time, San Diego was actually also looking for a pianist and they contacted me two years after the fact, and that's how I got into opera. Well, I love the by accident. I know that that's true for me. And uh, Kinsa, how about you? Um. I'm not sure mine was so by accident. I started as a solo pianist, went into more chamber music. From that, went into playing for singers. Really liked the fact that there was a language involved, a poem involved, and a, a language that wasn't always English. So my dream actually was to travel the world uh, performing art song. I met many people along the way, mentors that said, you won't be able to make a living just doing that. You've also got to teach or do some other things. Um, so they said, why don't you think about working for an opera house? And there you will learn more about the voice in general. 
you will learn wonderful repertoire and you'll get to know really good singers who then may be asked to do recitals and they may ask you if they know you and you have a relationship with them they may ask you to play for them and then you will do your art song which you really want to do so uh, opera was going to be my bread and butter it was going to pay the rent and so I decided to try that route and once you go down that road it's hard to come back and do anything else you're so involved in in the opera company that you don't really have much time for anything else and you don't want to leave it so here I am 13 years has it been 13 uh for 14 years later at Vancouver Opera um and yeah that's you know, it's interesting to see how you got somewhere because you never imagined 20 years ago that this is where you would be. Yeah, how very true. It is a, a bit of a rabbit hole, the world of opera. Once you kind of descend into it, it just seems to open up and kind of become infinite. It's, it's really amazing. Um, I'll stick with you to start this question, Kenza. What is it you love most about being a repetitor? Uh, simple answer, variety, diversity. Um, never the same thing twice. Uh, every day is different. The repertoire keeps changing. The people you work with, the cast, the conductor, the directors, they all change all the time. So there's like new blood. Um, uh, and as we get into further questions, we'll reveal more of what our job is, which is a huge variety of things other than just playing a piano. So it's the variety of the job that, that is, I think, I love the most. Absolutely. Tina, how about you? Yeah, I will add to the versatility and the variety of our job. Um, I really enjoy, even with working come, and coming back to working the same piece, but like Kinza said, with the different casting with different conductors with different directors they all bring very many different perspectives to what we all study very hard for the score so in a way it's character study and it's through music which is what i really really like about this job <laughs> indeed um and I'll, again sticking with you what are some of the aspects of the job that might surprise people and this might come up a little bit later if we get into specifics, but one of the most surprising aspects that I had to encounter was the mediation sometimes you have to do between a conductor and the performer. And sometimes it can be very easy to communicate that, and sometimes you have to tread very carefully how you express certain points to get both parties involved happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some good stories in there that uh, I, I don't there's know what are. There. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm looking forward to them hopefully yeah towards the tail end when we just like go wild on this and get all the you know the technical details out of, out of this out of the way. Um, how about you Kinza? What do you think some of the things are that, that surprise people the most? Um Singing and playing, I think, is a big one. Um, I remember doing uh, our, my first Onyegin with VOA many, many years ago now. And I, I might not have the facts exactly straight, but there were three cast members that were not in the room that I had to suddenly sing and play for in Russian. The mezzo, I think, was sick. The tenor had been replaced and hadn't arrived yet. And someone else came and didn't know the role. And so therefore couldn't, had to learn it first before he or she came back into the room. So I remember doing a scene or a couple of scenes and having to, from the piano, sing those roles in Russian. It was my first Russian opera. Um, but more importantly, another pianist had visited the rehearsal room that day because he or she was inquiring, inquiring about whether they wanted to go down that road and become a repetiteur. This person is a pianist and had played for many years, but had never done the role of repetiteur. And so was interested in what it might be like. Came to observe that rehearsal that day, 
saw what I had to do because I had to not just play a very tricky score, but I had to maneuver three different cast members in, in Russian. And this person left the rehearsal after and said, well, that's way too difficult. I don't know how I'd ever learn how to do that. Forget this repetitor business. So there was someone that was a very proficient <laughs> pianist that saw what, you know, might have to happen on one day. It's not always that that happens. That was sort of a special day, but that is part of our job sometimes. And this person thought, no, I, I wouldn't be able to, to do all that, learn all that. It's not worth it. And never came back and never went into that um, profession. So that was, that's something that we have to do in our job. By the way, we always have to do it on the spot. We're never, we never really know ahead of time. Sometimes we'll arrive at rehearsal and the singer was singing yesterday and is in town, but suddenly, you know, something scratchy is going on. So they just rather take it easy. And you don't know until you arrive 10 minutes before rehearsal, are you told that this person is going to be mute for the day? And you need to provide their voice for them. So you, you seldom get a lot of warning. And so suddenly the butterflies start and you just think, well, this is part of my job. Here we go. Totally. And actually, I remember um, a number of years ago when you very publicly did the singing for an exposed Jane Eaglin, of all people, singing, and you sang Lady Macbeth of Verdi. I believe it was the dress that was the public dress. dress there were rehearsal. people there, and you found out probably just when you showed up to the theater about half an hour before, like, oh, guess what? She's not singing tonight. Well, what are we gonna do? <laughs> and things like that. It's true. Are kind of amazing. I had a, a similar experience. It was way less public, but it was at the COC, like exactly twenty years ago when. The, uh, the the singer who was singing the role of, of uh, Fliegen de Hollander, um, I, I got to the theater and heard learned that they weren't singing. And I said, well, and they, what are we gonna do? And there was no cover and nobody in the ensemble was doing it. And I said, well, I'll do it just like stupidly. But I have to say that was kind of a make or break moment. And it's something I'll never forget. And people, uh, a, a friend of ours, we all I know a, a great guy who was singing in the chorus at the time. They're hearing this over the loudspeaker because it was in one of the scenes, uh, you know, where this chorus is on, not on stage. And they're like, who the hell is that? So he came running out on stage and looked and saw me in the front row sitting behind my maestro, Richard Bradshaw, God bless his soul, no longer with us. And he went running back into the room where they're all playing cards and they're, you won't believe it, it's less. And it was just like everybody thought it was hilarious. But this is the kind of thing, it's true, right? When you're repping, uh, you got to do. Uh, Tina, you ever had any what, a great diva moment like that where you uh, sang a big role either in rehearsal or even on stage or something? <laughs> I, well, I haven't, I haven't had a good opportunity, I guess, uh, if I can use that word, to sing yeah. on stage publicly as Tina has. That's, pretty, that's a very courageous act. I really commend you both for uh, that. Uh, just in rehearsal. Um, so in a room run, I've done, but not as public as a as a dress rehearsal. Yeah, it's so true, though, right? I mean, when you suddenly find out you have to do that, I mean, we've all, I'm, I'm sure, studied some singing and done that sort of thing, but it's not what you expect to do. And then suddenly it's true, exactly what you said, it came to like the butterflies or something, you're like, <gasps> yeah, this thing of like, oh my God, it, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, outrageous thing. It's one thing when it's your own gender, too. I remember once in a, for the Zitz Prova singing for an indisposed soprano, in Dialogue de Carmelita, and I just thought that was so unfair. <laughs> I thought, oh my God. I, like, well, no, like, I wasn't gonna embarrass myself that much, oh. but I remember just sitting there doing them, and I thought, oh, I just wanna crawl, uh, you know, under a rock somewhere. But uh, yeah, it's true, right? Things like that. Um, that leads so easily, I think, into the next question. Um, but pick up on this, if you wanna continue the, the thread. Um, um, what are some of the most nerve wracking aspects of the job and what are some of the most rewarding? We can split those up as well, but nerve wracking, I think what we were talking about is certainly an element of that. Who would you like to go uh, first? Well, go ahead, Kinza. Okay, um, nerve wracking. Um, chasing singers in recitatives, oh. especially when they jump a passage and especially when they jump from act one into act three <laughs> and you don't know if they're going to come back into act one and you don't know what their colleagues are going to do after the jumped line and you're far from them on the harpsichord and you in too far to prompt them and just hoping 
you know, that they find their way back. So that can be very nerve wracking and the most rewarding when it works itself out. Um, uh, Prompting from the wings. I had to do this at the Canadian Opera Company with Lady Macbeth of Nitsensk. I had to prompt someone from stage right in Russian, and that was very, very nerve wracking. Um, backstage conducting wow. when there's a chorus and a band, but usually the chorus when you have to make them sound like they're from a far away and you have to coordinate the tempo with the, with the pit. And with the curtains and the set pieces, of course, what you hear is delayed. And so you have to conduct ahead of time. And sometimes the backstage conducting comes across into the audience as being ahead. Sometimes it's behind. Sometimes it's perfect for a couple of bars. And then it just gets off. And of course, the audience just goes, well, they're not singing. They're singing behind. They're singing ahead. And they have no idea you know, how difficult it is and how you're trying your darndest to make it sound exactly in coordination, but it's really almost impossible. So those, though, that's really nerve wracking too. Another thing is getting to the gig and on the first day, starting at the beginning and they say, okay, we're gonna start with the opera curtain up and we're gonna stage the overture and <laughs> let's go. And you haven't inquired about it and you have to suddenly play a very difficult overture that you never practiced because you assume that the curtain's down because in the score it says the curtain's down. That's nerve wracking. So I always ask now if there's an overture, I find out, are they going to stage the overture? Because it can be really nerve wracking to have to play that sight read it For on sure. the very first day. Those are a couple things. <laughs> Those are great. And of course, yeah, the offstage conducting is uh, always a nightmare. Uh, I remember when I started and was really keen to get conducting opportunities, I was dying to get just the chance to conduct off stage. I soon learned that that is not exactly the most rewarding thing in the world, but it certainly is always very, very challenging. Tina, over to you. I mean, I have nothing to add to Kinza. Those are all my fears. And <laughs> my most probably proudest moments when they succeed as well. You know, um, I recently tried my hand at prompting and it is scary. And sometimes when it, you don't even know if the colleagues of the other of the other castmates on stage are going to jump in and help out. So there have been moments where some, you know, I'm prompting from the wings, but also the the, the singer colleague is helping out. So you have two conflicting information. That's always a little bit like, okay, so who do we go with now? And that is that is a a, a bit of question I think to also think about. Um, the backstage conducting is is tough and you have to really know for me the the theater very well and the configuration backstage and how how that translates into the theater and those that is always very different even if you do the same production the same theater over and over it seems like it's sometimes guesswork <laughs> Yeah, 100%. Of course, because even the set can make a huge difference or where they're placed. And I mean, we all know the Queenie Theatre really well, but it's true that every single time there, there are considerations that, that change that aspect. For our listeners and viewers, one of the things that um, we've been talking about, of course, are the recitatives, which um, appear in, if you think of the, the operas of Mozart, Don Giovanni, Così fan tutte, Le Nozze di Figaro, or Rossini, Barbia di Siviglia, the time when the harpsichord or forte piano is accompanying the singers and it's those times where uh, it's much more spoken, uh, the recitation and the whole idea is that the plot moves along a lot in those few pages or sometimes many pages uh, as opposed to the arias which tend to be more reflective uh, and, and character driven and it's so true right when you're accompanying that and somebody goes dry or jumps it, it is quite terrifying I, I had Daniel Coolidge on the show a few weeks ago and he talked about, he's somebody who sang uh, Don Giovanni, I believe in 14 or more productions around the world and he's got a bunch coming up, but he did his first Leporello just a, a year or so ago in Montreal. And he talked about, you know, he was constantly singing the Don's lines in his head and then <laughs> what's coming up with Leporello. But he did have a moment in one of the performances where just before, uh, I think it was Fincai del Vino, he said, which is almost all Leporello uh, recit, he just completely went dry and he started, you know, kind of doing what singers do is sort of <laughs> making up it's Italian to try and get back on. And he said it felt like an eternity. Uh, but and, he, and after, you know, it was probably all of like 10, 20 seconds. 
but uh, it's true, right? When you're at the keyboard, what do you do? And you're trying to read their minds and... And you never talk about it in rehearsal. And no. it's always, live performance, there's always gonna be glitches. I mean, we just did Barber of Seville and um, that was the one that Tina was prompting in the wings and I was playing the keyboard across the way and um, things happen and you, no one likes to talk about it, but I always like to say in rehearsal, okay, so do you tend to be a person that goes back and fixes what you've made a mistake of, or do you, do you like to continue or do you, do you like me to play your notes for you to get you at least the melody so you know where we are? Like, how do you want me to proceed with the little wiggle that we've just had? Mm -hmm. And it's a good word. No one wants to talk about it. And I just think it's probably going to happen. So let's just, let's just discuss what the remedy might be, but no one ever wants to. So when it happens, you're, you, you don't, you don't know which route to take. You don't know whether to go back to the line that was messed up or like, it, yeah. So, but no one ever wants to discuss how to. <laughs> it's true, right? You're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. I mean, you don't want to jinx it, but it's true that, but then again, two people will say, oh yeah, you know, I tend to go back for something and then you're ready with that and they, game plan. And, and then don't. that doesn't happen. This is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's just, uh, that's the thing about live theater, which I think uh, people can appreciate, of course, but the, the playbook is, it, you know, you've got it all planned and then stuff happens. And uh, it's what, what you do and how to recover. So very, very, very true. Um, I'm gonna move this in a slight direction. And we, again, like, feel free to, to bring this back, but I'll, I'll start with Tina on this one. Um, what are some of your favorite operas? And tell us about some personal highlights. Well, I like ensemble driven shows. I think it's so much fun to have all sorts of different characters make a show together. Um, and obviously the, the more the merry on stage. So shows like Johnny Speaky, like Fall Stuff that we'll be doing uh, next season at the Vancouver Opera are some of my favorite shows to listen to over and over again. Uh, I love The Marriage of Big Rook, which I consider an ensemble show. You can't do that show with any of the characters missing, in my opinion. Um, and I actually, in general, love all Mozart. Uh, uh, I don't I think they might disagree with me maybe later. <laughs> Um, the, some of the character driven operas I enjoy. So I, when I, re this sort of goes to reading books for me as well. So I enjoy books that explore, um, the psyches and the, the desires and the hopes of any specific character. So shows like, uh, Eugene Onegin and Madame Butterfly are also shows that I really really love because the music explores those uh, psych psychological hopes and dreams for me as well. And to say actually Madame Butterfly that Vancouver Opera did, was it 2014 or 2015? So last time when we did it, I think that was one of my favorite shows uh, VO has, has ever done. So that was conducted by you, Les. It was very well cast and everybody had such a great time, but making music together. And, and so I think with the experience of that, that's become one of my favorite shows, actually productions to date. Um, some of the, sh the, the Onegin that we did, was it also 2017, 2018? A couple of years ago was my first Onegin with a, entirely Russian cast. And I was really, really um, I appreciative of the fact that I could get to hear native speakers sing their own language uh, as my first introduction to Onegin. And that tells me so much about how Russian the, how the language Russian could be dealt in such a musical way that I had not thought before. So for me, that was a really special experience. Thanks, and th thanks for the, the nice words about Butterfly. I love that. And that was even, even double cast, but there, it was so harmonious. Um, the rehearsal period, I remember, and, and yeah, they, I thought outstanding cast that they put together. And 
Um, I have to say that the interlude between Acts 2 and 3 after the humming chorus, uh, the all night vigil kind of music, every time we did that and I was in the pit, I honestly, I, I, I was just dying inside in the most beautiful way, just thinking, I feel so lucky because that music just begins with just a hush, a whisper, and then it begins this, it becomes this huge thing. And yeah, it's, uh, it's true that there are just moments sometimes that like transform everything. I know for me anyway, so yeah. Thanks, that's a nice list. Kenza, over to you. Well, it's interesting that we're all saying Madame a Butterfly because that's on my list. Sweet. Um, and I've had the privilege of doing it with you, Les, and with your brother. Peter Dalla, that was oh my, my first God, that's right. butterfly, was, Pe wow. was Peter Dalla in Edmonton Opera. And, um, and then Jonathan, I believe, did the, yes. my yep. first one here, and then you did the second one. And I just remember, of course, my favorite opera is the one I'm currently working on. Yes. That's often an answer that people have, and it's quite true, because you really get to know it really well in the moment, and you think, no, this is the best opera, and, you know. And then the next one, no, no, this one's the best. But really, Madame Butterfly, it truly is. I remember just, just weeping while I was practicing it. Just the just Puccini at his best. Um, I just remember playing the music, just just thinking it was so well written. Um, we won't compare Puccini and Mozart because that's for another podcast. But um, <laughs> so beautifully written. So and because I've done that piece a couple of times now, um, all very different productions um and very beautiful um that's that's one of my highlights um john astasio's philomena is still up there it's his first opera um i got to help shape it if you will in banff um and then we did it in calgary um years and years and years ago it was my first time workshopping a new work so that's extra special. Plus staying at the BAM Center while you do so and meeting John and John, that's John Morell and John Estacio, everything linked together. Um, being so attached to the music he wrote and then had to discard because Kelly Robinson felt that the pacing wasn't happening fast enough. So, um, but giving feedback in the sessions of, of, you know, where, from where I was sitting, what I thought and sort of helping shape the opera. And I'm just getting so, um, known to it too and feeling so attached to it feeling like i helped birth this baby um and the storyline uh it, it was just all that was a wonderful wonderful project um so being included in new works is is another job that repetitors have um what else do i have here um nixon in china woohoo because for a pianist to play that type of music that's ever moving and fast and um gives you tendonitis is just really 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 exciting uh having to then play one of the piano parts in the pit on an old synthesizer and have the computer conk out on you and different electrical issues and the conductor yelling at you as if it's your fault and and having no room to turn a page because there's 16th notes for for miles and you have you can't drop a hand to turn a page and that whole, but that whole experience and, and playing that score by John Adams is just, will really stand out. And it was during the Olympics, 2010. So um, I'll forever remember that experience. Um, and then finally, uh, what really sticks out for me is, is Canadian Opera Company's Ring Cycle. Mm -hmm. So I have the privilege of playing all four operas. Let me get them. This is uh, Des Rheingold's. Die Walküre is next, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And Siegfried and the um, Bitte Dämmerung. I think it's about 13, 14 hours of music in total if you if you do play all the operas. Even more, actually. Um, yeah. Is it more than that? I wanted to, to not go over. Um, <laughs> That's... But I remember, so um, I played all four operas that summer. And so one morning I'd play Siegfried and then that afternoon I'd play Valkyrie and the next day I'd play Goethe Demerung and so so every every three hours I was shifting pieces it's the same work it's the same composer it's the same storyline woven throughout but having to learn that amount of music um and and rehearse one and then the other um especially when you have musical motives which are little themes and every time you play a theme in a different opera it's in the major key, it's in the minor key, it's half as slow, it's twice as fast. It's, um, you know, it's got all these 
this these variants and having to keep all those straight jumping from opera to opera was uh was very challenging but very rewarding and at, at, at the same time we opened the new opera house that they have so that whole project was was quite a highlight of my career so far and so now when i have to learn just a three and a half hour opera <laughs> it's, it's sort of easy compared to that summer when you had to know four um i bet yeah those are a couple of my favorite things that's an awesome list and it's true i mean that is an awful lot of music to have in your head and hands at one time um it, it's true that it makes you know when we think of you know we all trained as pianists so when you're preparing a five minute romantic piece or a beethoven sonata which could last anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes still if you're playing a three hour opera the the dimensions of time i think really are uh, are very different and it's something that uh Again, somebody only in the opera world, I think, can really relate to that. So, um, and I was going to turn it over to Tina. I, I think that was, was that the first show, Nixon in China, where you joined us? I know you played in the pit, you and Kinza, and I believe and Angus, Angus was Kellett. on the third key. There were three keyboard parts, and I, I really had so much admiration for for you down there because you were all dealing with with this, you know, technology. Uh, that could fail you at any moment. And I was in the house all the time. I was, I think I said on, on a, a previous session that I think that was the, the the first show where I literally wanted to be in the house for every second, uh, even of the performances, because it was such a, again, Michael Cavanaugh show, uh, Erhard Rahm created the, the set design and uh, another super, super highlight, but it must have been super, like stressful on those keyboards at the back there tina you have anything to say about nixon in china was that in fact your first vo show that was my first vo show in the pit i okay. actually didn't work on that show as a rep because i yep. was part of the vos at the same time uh -huh. okay i think while nixon was in in the theater somehow vos wasn't happening for those two weeks that we were that Right. Nixon was happening, so I could be in the pit. Um, but I, I think that was the hardest counting job I've ever had. To <laughs> you can't rely on what you hear, and sometimes you can't even rely on the beat pattern because what you see and what you what you see in your score and what you see the conductor doing and what you hear your music music colleagues doing around you they don't line up a lot of times. So you just have to really stick to your gun. And, know that you're right and then hope that yeah. you all meet at the end together <laughs> yeah that that crazy um, score i forget it has something like over a thousand like meter changes yeah in in the piece or something somebody counted them once i but i forget yeah um this yeah. leads really well into the last question i think i'll flip it over to tina to start because you, you've already got one uh in there to lead us off kids um share this is like dessert for me this is the fun part um please share some of the craziest funniest things that you've experienced in this profession the craziest thing i had to do uh one of the craziest thing i had to do was um maybe this is embarrassing so i won't name any names but i had to actually tell a conductor that he was reading a time signature wrong and it was <laughs> i hope it wasn't me <laughs> i'm trying to think <laughs> and it was messing up the rehearsal so many times and i finally and the singer kind of came up to me at break of the rehearsal and he was like is it me or what is going on i can't figure out what i'm doing wrong can you tell me what i'm doing wrong because you know kudos to this this singer he was very professional about it and and I just said, let me talk to Maestro and I'll get back to you. And and I couldn't figure out what he was doing. And then, I, then finally, as we were talking more and more, I, I figured out, oh, you're just reading the the note values wrong. It was one of those old French scores where the quarter rests look like eighth, the backward. Mm, yes, yes. Um, so it, somehow he misread that and was, was doing a bit weird things and anyway it, it, it got all figured out and it was fine after that. <laughs> <laughs> the other crazy thing one of the productions I did of Barbers of Seville was an outdoor production um, in Minnesota actually and in the in the heat of summer 
we had the orchestra was actually behind the stage so we had to set up monitors in order for the singers to be able to see the conductor um but summers in minnesota at least for the couple of shows that we did they were so hot that it affected the the cable speed of the monitors so i can see the monitors but the conductor can't see the monitors um and i'm look you know i'm looking at him but also looking at the conductor and it's about a three second delay <laughs> oh wow it was it was tough i mean the singers figured that out pretty quickly because they could hear the orchestra coming from behind them so in that case they were they had to rely on only what they hear um and hope that it's all together and they can't watch the monitors at all um it was also because it was so hot i had all these bugs in my store i was playing the rest of the tees for that show and all these bugs crawling all over my store and you're just trying to stay on top of your notes and like swap the bugs at the same time it was you don't want to see my barber score because it's pretty blotchy. <laughs> I still have that is amazing. <laughs> Actually, you reminded me. I spent three summers in Santa Fe, and that was exactly the same thing too. Like the mosquitoes and stuff. Like you open up a score that you've ever done there, and they're still covered <laughs> in like you know these little insects. And uh, yeah, turn the page, and it usually kills one. I mean, not that anybody I don't mean to kill anything, but yeah. And the conductors would often say that too, especially when it got really dark and they're in the pit, and so all these like flies and everything are around. I never, never would have thought of that if you hadn't mentioned it, but that's wild. Well, wow. yeah. Kenza, or sorry, do you, are you, do you have another one or? Uh, well, I guess maybe this, this goes to back to a little bit of maybe what a part of what a repetitor does a little bit. I, I had forgotten about this story and it's not that long ago. <laughs> um, I was doing this show where they had what looked like Chinese syllables at the beginning of the show, um, but I couldn't decipher what they're supposed to mean. It is a show that was set in Chinatown at the turn of the century of San Francisco. Um, and at the point, the librettist didn't actually write down what the syllables meant, that he just sort of had a bunch of syllables and we were, the chorus was expected to just yell them out. Um, so uh, this was at Wexford and David Agler, who was the artistic director of Wexford at the time, said, could you make sense of these syllables? Because we're live streaming this and we can't have random syllables broadcast into the world. Um, so, so with the director, we came up with syllables that are very similar in sound to what the librettist gave based on her concept of a staging um, to sort of give context to what these texts might mean. And to this day, I still don't know what those syllables mean and what they're supposed to mean, but that was one of the coolest, I think, parts of my job I've had to do so far as well. <laughs> they were lucky to have you on that. I certainly I couldn't mean, be of any help. <laughs> there was a lot of YouTube videos about dialects and, and sort of reading up on what was, you know, what sounds are what and sort of connecting the dots. But it was very, it was a very interesting experience. I, I really appreciated that. <laughs> wow. Awesome. Kenza, over to you. Well, the insect thing is interesting. I, I wanted to say that's one of the most nerve wracking things is to play outside, a show outside. I remember at Marilla having to play the Merry Wives of Windsor. And not only was it an upright panel, but um, the wind, even if it's not that windy, the wind is an issue with, with pages turning over on you. Insects, huge one, especially if you have a light on your, on your piano, they get attracted to the light. And being miles from the conductor, because he's center stage and you're way off somewhere. And, you know, singers are standing between you and him. You can't see him half the time. I mean, that's just very, very, very nerve wracking to do anything outdoors. Um, I think I mentioned having to sing and play at the piano in rehearsal is one thing. Um, when you know you're not having a bunch of people hear you, it's a closed rehearsal. But some of the most interesting um, moments were when I had to sing something in front of an audience, which was Lady Macbeth. Um, but also orchestra texts where we have donors present or a Zitzprobe where I had to sing Turandot in front of the whole orchestra. You, you just suddenly it's more people 
seeing what you're doing. And, and a lot of them are alarmed because they don't realize that your job entails that. And so they come up and go, wow, how did you do that? Good for you. Ah, you, you speak Italian. They ask all these questions that you kind of go, well, yeah, that's part of our job. We just don't always get to display it. So those have been some interesting parts of the job. And again, you, you never find out until you arrive that this is about to happen. The prompting from the wings is another one. Um, how about this? Teaching a bagpipe player how to follow a conductor's baton. How about an accordion player following a conductor? How about a guitar player following a conductor? What do those three instruments have in common? None of them have to ever be in an orchestra where they're following a conductor. They can be in a band, but conductor list, but none of those instruments are used to playing in a symphony and following the guy or the girl with a stick. And so can you imagine those three instruments all being in one opera, Philomena by John Astasio, and I have, having to set them straight and, and making them figure out how to follow a baton when it's not a, it's not a quick lesson. It's, no. you know, we all, we all take a while to actually learn how to do it. So you can't just teach them in 10 minutes, but that was my job was to try to get these people to, <laughs> to follow because the chorus is singing along with the big pipe. So is the orchestra. I mean, you, you have to coordinate, you have to be, but trying to teach these very for, foreign opera instruments to, um, to be with the conductor is, is interesting. Um, surtitles. I've had to jump in for surtitles. Um, I played a show Wozzeck, um at the COC and it's one thing to play the score and to sing the German, but suddenly uh, the person that was doing the surtitles had a, a back problem suddenly and had spasms and just couldn't be there. So they just say, well, Kinza knows the score. She plays and sings the score. She can do surtitles. And I think, yeah, I know what the words mean. Yeah, I know how the music goes, but I don't know how long the surtitle sentences are. I don't know, like, that's what you have to rehearse. And you rehearse for a good week before you put the performance on with telling the computer when to go to the next screen. Like, it's, there's a rhythm to it that you have to learn. And I had to just suddenly go into the booth. Here's your computer. Here's the enter button. Here's the score. And I had to figure it out. And of course, there's always, even with high technology, there's a delay between the surtitle booth, which is always way at the back of the theater in the nosebleed section. And you're trying to send a signal to the surtitle screen, which is above everyone's heads. And that takes always a bit of time. And so you have to always be thinking ahead of time to press the button ahead of things. And especially when you're sitting up there and you're looking down at the stage and people are this big and you're trying to press the button before they even open their mouths. And you can't see, you need binoculars to see when they're about to breathe and go. Because in Wozzeck, there's, a, there's some text that's just spoken with no music. So it's out of time. Anyway, that was very nerve wracking. You can also, if you start thinking about your laundry list or anything, if, you, if you're distracted for one <laughs> second, the surtitles get off and you can't, you know, you can't speed them up. You can't, if you'll show your mistake to the world if you actually try to fix it. So you, it, it's one of the most nerve wracking jobs I've ever had to do, period. And, but they think, oh, repetitors can do that. She'll just step in and do it. And so I just remember thinking, wow, the person that normally does this is like kudos to them because it's also something that everyone sees and everyone depends on as an audience member. So um, our, our job, it's, it's funny. When people ask what I do, I start by just saying, I'm a pianist. I coach languages because some people come to rehearsal and they, they, they're not quite sounding Italian enough. So we have to help them get better. There's so many aspects to our job and you describe everything you do and you take a few minutes to describe it. And then that person's spouse walks up and this person says to the spouse, hey, come and meet Kinza. She's an opera singer. And so after moments and moments and moments of, of explaining what we do in great detail, people come away saying, oh, so you're an opera singer then. And I'm like, so it's, it really is a, a, a job that's um, behind the scenes, in the background, in closed rehearsals, uh, you'd have to actually spend a week with us um, with a camera to see what all we do because it's you explain it and people just can't envision what it is and they so I just give always a very simple answer because the detailed one it seems to just you know go over their head right but there it it's is. so true <clears throat> it does entail an awful lot of skills and both of you are truly exceptional at what you do
Kinza and Tina, it's been such a pleasure having you both on the show. Um, you've really, I think, helped demystify what repetitors do. Uh, do you want to leave any last thoughts for our audience today? I'll start with you, Tina. Um, any thoughts, anything we didn't cover? I think that's a lot of, lot of jobs that we've covered, but I mean, feel free to shadow any of us. <laughs> it would be, yeah, that, I think that's probably the best way. I, my, I myself didn't realize how much work or how many job descriptions go into, the, into one tiny word of repetiteur until I started doing it. So, and I'm still discovering what any of all those jobs are. So it is a very much, uh, a, I guess, career vocation, a lifelong career. All I have to say. <laughs> Thanks for Beautiful. having me. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. Kenza, over to you. Yeah, I think we're a bit like octopi, where we're, we have many tentacles doing many things, and we didn't even cover the, the psychologist, counselor. You know, Tina touched on it briefly about being the segue between conductors and singers, but often for singers, we have to be comforting. We have to be other things just as friends and um, colleagues too. Um, emotional moments happen and, and you have to be there for them to lean on. But I guess um, as we learn our craft as repetiteurs, we don't realize how much we've actually learned until we mentor young pianists that want to become repetiteurs. And that's the last couple of years working with our young artist pianists that have come through our program at Vancouver Opera. That's when you realize, oh, I used to be like you where I hadn't learned everything that I've learned now. Uh, and you see the, the hardships and struggles uh, and the rewards that they have. And you think that used to be me. And so that's, I think, been very revealing to show um, how far we've come uh, down the road, you know, 10 years or 20 years of doing this job. You realize you started out like them with with less knowledge than you know now and and you realize oh yeah it was hard it's singing and playing oh yeah it was hard playing and saying your phone number to to make sure that your brain can separate you know into compartments and different things when you see the younger people trying what what you did many many years ago you realize how um multi-dimensional our job is and multitasking it's yeah. true right we, we never stop learning yeah Very right true and that's the rewarding part of the job, I think, that we never reach the cap. 100%. Yeah, yeah, it's an endless mountain that we're climbing. Indeed, but a beautiful mountain. I thank you again both so very much for being on the show and on this first time special video episode of Vancouver Opera Offstage. All best and hope to see you both in person next time yes. soon. Thank you. Yes. Thanks so much. Bye. We'd love to hear from you if you have any feedback or suggestions for upcoming guests. You can reach us via email at online at vancouveropera.ca. And don't forget to check out our weekly special features on our website at vancouveropera.ca forward slash offstage. This has been Vancouver Opera Offstage. I'm your host, Les Dalla. As always, you can keep up to date with Vancouver Opera at vancouveropera.ca, where you can sign up for our e-newsletter or follow us on social media. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.